we're all still here. Um, this is a very important subject indeed. Um, the fate of what's happening in Tibet matters to all of us. It has global implications. This is the first time that a group of Tibetans has been attending an international climate change forum to speak about what's happening in Tibet. So this is very much breaking news and making history um, to an extent. It's also a debate that China um, wants to suppress, of course. Tibet is the world's highest and largest plateau. It's the world's third pole because it contains the biggest ice fields outside the Arctic and the Antarctic. It also plays an essential role in the intricate process that creates monsoon rains across Asia. This underlines why we should all be concerned by a startling fact about which very few people are aware. Tibet's climate is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. The impact of the current melting of Tibet's glaciers, more than 40,000 of them, is likely to be catastrophic. Limiting the speed of this change is everybody's responsibility. Tibet's climate is a global issue. Tibet's high altitude, rugged terrain and harsh ecosystem have resulted in the creation of sustainable systems of traditional agriculture livestock rearing. Until now, as a result, Tibet's landscape and ecosystem has remained relatively intact. But China's policies of fast-track economic development based on an urban industrial model are damaging the fragile high altitude plateau and they're threatening to severely alter the hydrological regime of Tibet, as well as depriving Tibetans of the stewardship of their land at a time of global environmental crisis. Scientists have warned that increased urbanization, infrastructural development in Tibet may be contributing to the adverse impact of global warming in Tibet. The Chinese government has also been implementing policies of settling Tibetan nomads, displacing them from their land, confiscating their land, and fencing pastoral areas. Um, the panel will speak more about this issue, but this has resulted in nomads losing their livelihoods and living in isolated encampments. These policies are detrimental to Tibet's fragile ecosystem, as they're threatening the survival of the rangelands and Tibet's biodiversity. Recent research has suggested that grazing can mitigate the negative warming effects on rangeland abundance and resilience. <coughs> and what we'll be speaking about here today is that there is a consensus among Chinese, Western, Tibetan scholars that the traditional ecosystem knowledge of Tibetan nomadic pastoralists protects the land and livelihoods and helps restore areas that are already degraded and suffering from the impact of climate change. So what we'll be speaking about today is why the involvement of Tibetan nomads is essential to sustaining the long-term health of the ecosystems and water sources on which China and the rest of Asia depend. China is now pursuing also massive inter-basin, inter-river water transfer projects in Tibet, which are threatening to cause even more damage to the fragile ecosystem of Tibet. China plans to build nearly 100 dams across the Tibetan plateau and several water diversion projects to move water into northern and eastern China. And these projects will disrupt already overstressed water supplies of hundreds of millions of people in South and Southeast Asia. So, very good morning to all. I'm happy to see a lot of people here who are interested who want to know more about the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, I also welcome all the panelists. So, as the, the name suggests, the Tibet Third Pole, you can clearly understand the importance of this word, Third Pole. As uh, thousands of peoples are like forbidden from their organizations, and their silent voices are not often heard on the plateau. So we are here on this platform in order to raise their voice, their concerns, so that it could be 
spread the party. So in this presentation, I will try to be as brief as possible. And if you have any questions, we are happy to take at the end of the session. Uh, <coughs> so my first slide, as the Tibet, why Tibet matters? As you have seen from this slide yesterday, they were showing at the ballot center of the US EPA, they are concerned about this North Antarctica. Now here we are concerned about the Himalayan issues. Tibet heard for. It has been recorded that more than 40,000 glaciers are recorded on the Japan Plateau, the Himalayan range. And it is called the third pole because it has the largest ice mass sheet outside the two poles. It's called Hindu Kush glaciers. And next, in the significance of the Japan Plateau, as you can see from the NASA animated image here, the whole plateau is raised like 4,000 to 5,000 meters above the sea level, the average altitude of the plateau. So this plateau acts as the barometer of the Asia. Somehow it also influences the frequency of the monsoon, Southeast Asian, the summer monsoon. It's more like an island in the sky. And it's also famous, known as the water tower of Asia. As you can see, major rivers of the Asian countries, they have their head regions on the Tibetan Plateau. As you can see it from this map, you can see the significance of the plateau itself. How many waters the head regions are originating from the plateau itself. And due to this climate change impact and land use policies, the sustainability, the health of this river basin and the river system has been threatened. And it is said that more than 1.3 billion people lived or they are directly related to these watershed areas. As you can see, the fresh water, for example, in China, 30% of the fresh water directly flows from Tibetan Plateau. And all those waters, they are not directly a source of the glacial meltdown. They also have their own underground sources. As you can see, I have here listed here, Singhi Kapa is the Indus River, which flows into Pakistan and Yalung Tsangu or the Brahmaputra and Yalmungu Chu Salvin, Tachu, we call it in Tibetan Tachu, Mekong internationally and Yellow River and Yangtze. They all have their head regions on the Tibetan Plateau. And now in this case of the climate change scenario and global warming, the head regions of these waters are degrading and it's drying up. You'll see in my few slides now, the second thing I want to touch is it's a very global issue about the glaciers, how they are retreating. And this picture, we have the courtesy from RGS London. And this picture was taken in 1921. As some of you might have seen these pictures now, just clearly comparing it here, you can see how much amount of glaciers have retreated. They say more than 80% of the glaciers have retreated. If you could quickly compare it here, you can see very clear. This is the eight sized Rongpu Glacier of the Mount Everest. And I have another picture here. It was taken in 1921. And it has been said that since 1950, there is no net accumulation. The net accumulation of snow is zero. So since then, the glaciers are retreating at a very alarming rate. Now the big question remains about the health of the river. How long? The security? the river basin areas, the countries that are dependent <coughs> on the rivers, how long they can usefully, they can independently and healthily, confidently use these water sources. It's a big question. <coughs> now, as the glaciers, they retreat. They form glacial lakes. There's another problem. The sudden outburst of these glacial lakes creates a lot of problems. And we have EC Mode, an international organization, that have Recently, in 2009, one of the information sheets, they have said that more than 2,000 glacial lakes are recorded in some parts of the Hindu Kush Glacier. I can show you this picture. This is a picture of a glacial lake. The whole derbis has been blown down by the glacier, and when the banks they erupt, it creates huge flood in the neighboring areas and the countries without any alarm. 
And the next issue that I want to touch is the desertification. And this picture is taken in 2008. You can see the extent of desertification here on the Japan Plateau. Since the plateau is 80% or 82% is covered with permafrost, and with this current age, with this scenario of global warming, the permafrost are degrading. This is what the science tells us. The permafrost is degrading, and it also increasing. The desertification rate is very high. One of the uh, UNDP reports suggests that it's uh, more than 2,000 square kilometers per year. The grasslands for the plateau has been converted to deserts. Now, the desertification brings us to another interesting question about the policies. In order to protect the grasslands, the Chinese have implemented grassland policies. <coughs> you can see very clear from here the fencing of the grassland. So this policy has somehow, the fencing policy has encouraged or has increased the rate of the grassland degradation. As we have also some scientific backings which says that the global warming and the grazing, they cancel each other. So in order to protect the grasslands, the policies, we have displacement of thousands of nomads from their pasture lands, who has been successfully stewarding the grasslands for thousands of years. They have been displaced into permanent concrete settlements. And we know that the policy is not working, and their voices are not heard. So, if I may show you this picture, earlier the nomads, they independently, they fully moved from their own summer pastures, winter pastures, <coughs> and they have very, lived a very mobile life. Now this policy, you can see how these nomads are displaced in those concrete buildings. Apart from the health of the grasslands, you can see indirectly, you can see the culture, the pastoralist culture is also in a very danger level, endangered. These nomads, since now they have been settled, they don't have any skills to earn their living. So a lot of them act into petty crimes, dancer. And uh, another we did a quick map here with some graph. We see this is the temperature of Lhasa, the capital city, in 1980. And we have found, interestingly, that the temperature has been increasing at a very high rate. But this doesn't show you the trend. It will give you some idea how the temperature has been increasing. And this rise in temperature <coughs> somehow degrades the permafrost. As I've mentioned earlier, you can see that almost 80% of the plateau is covered with permafrost. And these permafrost play a very important role in maintaining the carbon balance. Millions of tons of carbons that are stored in these permafrost are being evaporated are being emitted into the atmosphere. So as a result, these permafrost, they also have a very important role in maintaining the water security. Because, for example, this picture <coughs> is the source of Machu, or the Yellow River. It's the head region of the Yellow River, where it originates. And you can see there's been annual drop in the groundwater level. It's uh, one of the Japanese scientists, they say it's 10 centimeter per year the groundwater level has been dropping at this rate. So at this scale, you can see how long the water can sustain. And this Yellow River plays a very important role in Chinese civilization. And I have some pictures here about home frost degradation, the slow failure. The local people think that this is a very simple landscape. It's a landslide. But actually, this is what happens when the home frost degrades. The vegetative mat all thing, they all get desert, and finally it converts into a desert area. Uh, I have some more pictures here. And this is not an accumulation of rainfall water. 
when the permafrost melts, the soil that holds the moisture, the ability of the soil to hold the moisture is gone. And finally, it's been converted into <coughs> desert. The species are changing. And you can see this side. It's also one of the land use. On the other side, you can have the National Highway, which was constructed earlier in the 1960s. And it was renovated in the 1970s. And these activities has resulted in further degradation of the permafrost. <coughs> Not to mention about the recent railway network. It was earlier. And it was said that uh, <coughs> 30% of this road has to be renovated every year. So this is a very interesting picture. This is a highway. <coughs> and on the other side of the highway, on each 5 to 10 meters, have you ever noticed something like that? So this is a land degradation. This shows the permafrost are degrading. And it spreads like a wildfire a very slow rate, except, and there is nothing the modern technology or science can do about it, to bring that back to that original state. That's all. Thanks so much. <laughs>
Now, based again on my own experience of, of having undertaken community-based needs assessments with Tibetan nomadic communities, for those who did give their agreement, it cannot be assumed that their consent was informed. Many people did not actually understand that the implications of being, being able to move roam freely and then being moved to an area that's fenced off, that that fenced off land would be sufficient to sustain enough animals. So when you've got hundreds of animals that you can move on the summer pasture land and then you're moved into a fenced off area, ordinarily your herd might reduce down to perhaps five or six animals. And that's not enough to maintain that traditional sustainable livelihood strategy. For others, the motivation to move into the fixed dwellings that we've seen images of was based on promises of access to health centres, to schools, and often these didn't materialise. Now, it's very difficult to assess actual numbers of nomadic resettlement. Numbers can vary greatly. Now, in the region where I worked, the Chinese government claimed in 2005 that 89% of nomads had been resettled. Now, that's approximately 100,000 families. Not individuals, but families. And just to put that into some context, that's one in every, one in every 10 people living in central Copenhagen, it's them and their families being moved on, being moved into fixed urban settlements without consultation, without compensation. Now, as I've said, it's difficult to understand and actually confirm numbers, but we do already know what some of the implications are. Now, people are being housed in very remote areas where there are few, if any, employment opportunities. And even where employment opportunities do exist, most nomadic people do not have the vocational skills or the language skills, which in sight of it, unfortunately now is Chinese if you want to be involved in trade and business, to actually participate in the economy. So effectively, there's no means to generate income and people are being trapped into abject poverty. As one Tibetan nomadic person put it, we've become state dependents. Now you're probably asking yourself, or if you're not, you should be, um, what's the motivation behind nomadic resettlement? So by moving Tibetans off their lands, this land is now available for mining and water damming projects. China has also admitted its political motivation to resettle nomads. In 2007, the party secretary stated that restructuring was not only to promote economic development, but to counteract the Dalai Lama's influence. If we step back to spring 2008, we saw nomads jumping on horses and riding bareback into small towns and putting up the Tibetan flag. And I can assure you that was a massive driver and that really rocked Beijing, seeing ordinary Tibetan nomads challenging Tibet Chinese rule over Tibet. Um, more recently, the Chinese administration has been using environmental justifications, for example, preserving the grasslands <coughs> as justification for resettlement. Now, like the nomadic people in no Mongolia, the Tibetan nomads are part of the solution. <coughs> they are the stewards of this fragile ecosystem. <coughs> now, to help slow down, if not reverse, the environmental degradation of the Tibetan plateau, their knowledge should be and has to be harnessed. The Tibetan nomads need to be part of any activity to mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change in the region. Now, if we fail to do this, we're not only failing the Tibetan nomads, but we're failing future generations of our own children. Thank you. <coughs> right, I've been in, in 2007, back to Tibet as I undercover, and I've been to a few uh, nomads resettlements. My first impression, I've, I've been there, oh, first when I saw the settlements, I thought that the settlement was in the middle of nowhere, very far from the city, and uh, I thought, oh, this looks like a prison. Uh, and then uh, we tried to drive inside the, uh, the settlement. The first thing I've seen, there are few nomads, nothing to do, 
and plain American pool. There's American pool, two pool tables. And then we seek, we couldn't walk inside because I've got friends with uh, uh, British friends. So we secretly uh, drive to in the, in the uh, settlement. What we can see is uh, there's nothing in the house and just one room and uh, uh, maybe half the size of this uh, uh, this room. That, that's all. And uh, we couldn't see any schools there and uh, there's no electricity in there and no water. I can Only I can see is there's one tap water they are sharing uh, in uh, the whole community. Uh, then we, I've spoke one of the uh, our friends saying, uh, you know, is there any uh, schools and uh, uh, the clinics? He said uh, the government says they're going to set up a school clinic a year and a half ago, but still uh, it's nothing happening. If they need to go to a school, it takes like 40 <coughs> kilometers from where they live. Uh, <coughs> so I went to another uh, uh, nomad resettlement with a, a hidden camera. Uh, <coughs> I've, this time I've spoken to, to a few nomads and uh, only the question I've asked them you know how many households moved down here and uh, each time like 300 400 nomads moved down the uh, from the grassland and uh, then I said are you happy here she said you know the, everybody I uh, questioned everybody said no we don't happy here because we, they are you to live in a, in a nomadic la land you know and we want to go back, but we cannot go back because the government confiscated everything. And f you know, when the government, tr uh, you know, first moved down, the government promised, okay, let's move move down the settlement, stay there four, five, or six years, and after that you can move back. And they have been there like ten years already, but you know, the, the government won't let them again. And one normal uh, lady says, uh, she secretly hide a few yaks in the mountain and sometimes she goes back to see the yak and one day government find out and she has got some yaks in the, in the mountain she's hiding and they, they confiscated uh, her yaks and she banned to go, go back from the grassland. Thank you very much. <laughs>